Hey, hi everyone. Thank you for joining the session on how can AI inclusively advance agri-food systems. My name is Mark Skuman. I'm a partner at Genesis Analytics, where I lead our Center of Digital Excellence team. I'm joined today by my colleague, Chloe von Vidden, who will be presenting with me. Um, today's session is such an exciting topic because we're currently living through the most rapid advancements in AI capabilities that anyone has seen. Now, AI as a family of technologies is certainly not new. Commercial applications of AI have been around since the early 1990s, and we are already accustomed to AI-enabled applications in our everyday lives since the development of modern smartphones from the 2010s onwards. Examples include automated personal assistants like Siri and Alexa, and our common use of um, GPS navigation apps like Google Maps. But what makes the last few years particularly significant for AI development, and which has led people like Bill Gates to declaring that we are now in the age of AI, is the massive increases in both the scale and capabilities of AI models. And I think anybody here who's used OpenAI's fourth generation of its ChatGPT generative AI chatbot will have a clear sense of why this is the case. So we'll come back to the issue of scale and capabilities of AI models a little bit later. Now, these capabilities and the recent advancements are, are really exciting, but all of this is well and good for affluent users with access to fast and affordable internet and the ability to pay for these solutions. So the advent of AI-enabled smart farming amongst large commercial farmers in the global north and in small pockets in regions like Africa we can take as a given. But are these recent developments in AI really relevant to small-scale agricultural producers in low- and middle-income countries? Bearing in mind that on average, these producers are some of the poorest and most digitally excluded in the world. Well, much of what my colleague Chloe and I will be taking you through today is based on work that we've been doing with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the US Agency for International Development to explore the relevance and impact of AI and automation technologies on this group of people, small scale producers in low and middle income countries. And when we started engaging with the AgDev community about this topic, most people were highly skeptical. They said things like the small scale producers that we work with um, haven't even mechanized their production methods yet let alone making use of advanced technologies like AI. And these concerns are valid and were a big focus of our work, um, understanding the realities of small-scale producers and the constraints that they face. But we discovered that already in small pockets, small-scale producers are benefiting from AI-enabled solutions that make use of smart technology on the back end, but deliver the information or the inputs to the agricultural producers using very low-tech channels like USSD or SMS, or through human intermediary networks, like extension workers or field agents. And so the crux of our work has been identifying where these models can be scaled and what it would take to steer the development of AI applications in agriculture to more inclusive outcomes. So that's really the, the focus of today's session. And we wanna cover four main themes um, in, in what we will present today. Firstly, what is AI and why is it an important technology for agri-food value chains? Secondly, where are AI applications being developed across the agri-food value chain with particular touch points for these small-scale agricultural producers? Thirdly, what are the impacts of these solutions on agri-food systems in low- and middle-income countries, both the positive impacts and the negative impacts? Um, then we'll take a quick break for some Q&A and some um, uh, audience participation. And then lastly, we'll come back to our final topic. How can we actually steer AI and automation, automation innovation towards more inclusive outcomes? And stick around for that last topic because we'll be putting some concrete solutions on the table. Um, we're really keen to hear what everyone has to say about this topic. Um, so we'll have another Q&A session towards the end where you can share your views. So starting off with the, the first question, you know, what is AI? Why does it matter for agriculture? Um, without getting into too many of the technical details at its highest level, we can think about AI like a computer program that's designed to do things which would normally require human intelligence. 
And this includes solving problems, recognizing patterns or speech, making decisions, or even understanding and generating human language. To make this more practical, um, we think it's useful to segment AI into its different functions or capabilities. So analytical AI can discover new insights, patterns, and relationships in large data sets. This is useful for informing decision-making along the agricultural value chain. For example, this may include calculating the optimal interest rate for a small-scale producer that wants to borrow credit or calculating the best time for a small-scale producer to plant their crops based on a variety of data. Functional AI interacts with the physical world by executing automated actions. So robotics is a form of functional AI, which, for example, helps to train automate autonomous vehicles to navigate and drive safely. Um, robotics is typically leveraged in sectors like mining, transport, manufacturing, um, where they perform dangerous, repetitive, physically onerous tasks. But it is also being used on larger farms to automate tractors, harvesters, sort produce, etc. Interactive AI enables automated communication with people. And this form of AI can interpret and respond to human commands in a personalized way. So common applications include chatbots, which may be used for personalized advisory services to small-scale producers. Um, interactive AI often leverages textual AI, which is the application of AI to text or speech data, typically through natural language processing. Uh, natural language processing is used in tasks such as translation, answering questions, and the generation of new written or spoken content. And natural language processing has an important role to play um, in ag tech for small scale producers in such areas as being able to interpret questions and providing advice and response or automatically translating responses into local dialects. And then lastly, visual AI is the application of AI to images and visual data, which allows machines to classify or segment the contents of an image. So, you know, visual AI is applied in the field of computer vision, which could involve the classification of a crop pest from a mobile phone photograph, or the identification of which segments of a satellite image contain a particular crop. And this information can be used in a number of ways, uh, including to advise on farmers' responses to pests, or to help policymakers predict national crop yields. Now, AI applications today are still far from what is termed artificial general intelligence, which is the ability to independently and intelligently think and reason across all of these functions like humans do. Um, there is a raging debate in the computer science field at the moment around how close we really are to artificial general intelligence. But for now, we're not there yet. However, what does distinguish the capabilities of AI today from five or 10 years ago is the size and the sophistication of AI applications. In terms of size, um, there have been massive increases in the capacity and decreases in the affordability um, of computing power. And this has been coupled with really significant increases in the volume of electronic data that is generated which has meant that really massive AI models can be trained using enormous amounts of data. And as a result, many modern AI models can perform a really wide variety of functions to a much greater degree of precision than previous AI models have been able to. And that's what makes it such an exciting general purpose technology for application in sectors like agriculture. Um, so before we explore the specific AI applications of relevance in the agri-food value chain in low and middle income countries, we're going to hear a short message from Mark Arura, who's a technical advisor at GIZ's AI for All initiative. My name is Mark Arura. I work with GIZ as a focal person for a global program known as Fair Forward, based here in Nairobi. Um, to answer this question that has to do with um, why AI matters for small holder farmers, I think there's a, the broader issue around diffusion of technology. And by that, I mean, we do not want to exacerbate the digital divide uh, by confining the deployment of AI to just uh, big corporations or big companies or farmers who have large tracts of land 
because traditionally, I think in a lot of sub-Saharan Africa, um, it is smallholder farmers who, feel, who feed uh, more than 80% of, of, of the population. And by that, I mean, they do grow food for subsistence to, to be food secure at the household level uh, and to improve nutrition at the household level, but also like the surplus is sold to pay school fees, uh, to take kids to school and so forth. So we should harness the benefits of AI to, to smallholder farmers. Uh, and, and this technology is not cheap. But then uh, because of the reasons I just provided, I think there is enough justification to try and tailor uh, farm management or extension sort of information services to advise these farmers on, on what, how to go about what they want to do, whether it's weather, whether it's applying fertilizer, whether it's when to irrigate and so forth. I think such can improve livelihoods, such can also help to optimize the yield for the farmers. And I think over the long term as well, we are able to collect this information and this data and see uh, how things are changing over a long time, whether it's the condition of the soil or, you know, it is the changing weather patterns and do the farmers need to adjust, for example, to climate smart seeds such that they can optimize their yields. I think, thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Mark, for sharing that message. Name is Mark Hirura. So now we're going to move on to looking at what the um, particular applications of AI are in the agri-food value chains with relevance to small-scale producers. So I mentioned at the beginning that there are already these small pockets of adoption of AI-enabled solutions that are impacting small-scale producers in low- and middle-income countries. And we identified this by doing a global mapping of these solutions across the agri-food value chain and then um, categorizing them according to the function that that technology application is providing. So this mapping doesn't cover everything that's going on in the space, particularly all of the smart farming innovations that are impacting large commercial farms, but we picked the use cases with the most potential for adoption and impact among small scale producers in low and middle income countries. And we thought it was useful to split the use cases according to two broad functions. The first is planning and monitoring solutions. And these are providing policymakers, farmers, and other stakeholders with tools that help to improve their decision-making, often by delivering more accurate data and advice in near real time. And then the second is automated action solutions that are triggering an action that would otherwise have been completed by a human. So for example, robotic machinery that's automatically sorting fruit into high, medium, and low grades is an automated action solution. Um, and then we mapped all of the use cases according to the domain in the agri-food value chain where that use case is unlocking value. So the first domain is on-farm management. And this is looking at where AI and automation technologies are being used to facilitate better input planning related to such issues as what and when to plant, what inputs to use and mitigating against, mitigating against common on-farm risks such as pests, diseases, and extreme weather. The second domain is finance and risk management solutions, which are using AI and automation technologies to expand agri-food stakeholders' access to financial products and services, such as payments, credit, and insurance. And the last domain is supply chain and ecosystem management solutions which use AI and automation technologies to facilitate better linkages across the value chain. Um, we don't have time to go into the details of all of these use cases. So I wanna zoom in on the six that we feel have the greatest potential for adoption and impact among small scale producers. And this is partly because these use cases can tackle some of the key technology, trust and affordability constraints that small scale producers in particular face. So let's start with genomic innovation. This is about optimizing the genetic structure of crops, livestock, fish, or bio inputs like fertilizer to be resilient to challenging growing conditions or to optimize their features in terms of nutrition. Now, identifying the combination of genomes that will achieve those desired outcomes 
has traditionally been done through a long and laborious process of crossbreeding and growing different varieties and then testing their outputs. And this just takes way too long. Um, however, through being able to label, process and model genetic data, often using machine learning techniques, the ability to identify the combination of genomes that actually provide these outputs has massively sped up this process. And of course, you know, while this AI technology is being used far upstream in the ag value chain, it certainly can have a large impact on small scale producers in getting access to the best inputs possible for their conditions. Next, digital on-farm extension advisory. We know that extension services are critical to providing farmers with recommendations related to planning, production, post-harvest handling and processing. But extension worker networks are spread far too thin and the existing digital services providing farmers with advice aren't able to provide highly personalized or localized advice and therefore aren't well trusted. So the next generation of these automated extension services that are being developed are using interactive large language models like those used in, in ChatGPT. Um, an example is Digital Green's AI chatbot, which provides extension workers working with farmers and the farmers themselves with automated personalized responses to questions that are posed by the user. And this is based on a generative AI model that Digital Green trained on their large corpus of ag advisory content. Um, farm health monitoring solutions are helping farmers to monitor crop or livestock health, as well as soil, air and water quality, using a combination of data from remote sensing technologies, such as drones, IoT sensors, and most importantly, satellite imagery, because it's much more cost effective, but also even from simple pictures that are taken by a smallholder farmer using a smartphone. So for example, uh, Wadwani AI's early warning system for cotton farmers um, in India allows farmers to upload a photo of pests that have been collected in commonly used pheromone traps to the Wadwani AI Cotton Ace app. And the AI algorithm then identifies and counts the pests in the photo and determines the level of infestation with advice then provided to the farmer on the best way to deal with it. And this information is then shared with neighboring farmers in a cascading way for whom no additional tools such as smartphones are necessary to access this information. Alternative credit and insurance solutions are using AI uh, to enable financial inclusion by increasing the number of people who qualify for and can access affordable credits and insurance, chiefly by using non-traditional data and predictive machine learning algorithms. So in the credit space, data from a range of different sources like digital payments information, psychometric profiles, SMS data, or social media activity is being analyzed via machine learning techniques to provide um, near real-time risk assessments to credit providers, even when the small-scale producer doesn't have any formal credit record. And in the insurance space, combining satellite and weather data with AI applications are really significantly driving down the risk assessment and verification costs of providing agricultural insurance. So for example, Apollo Agriculture uses AI to analyze various data points, such as satellite data, soil data, weather patterns, historical agricultural yield data, to better understand and predict agricultural risks um, of, of the small scale producers that they cover. But most importantly, the automated underwriting algorithm allows the company to offer insurance products without the need for extensive and expensive on the ground inspections, which massively drives down the cost of the premiums that they have to charge and therefore make it much more affordable either to the small scale producers themselves or to the value chain stakeholders who are willing to fund those premiums. And then lastly, demand supply matching platforms are making it much easier for small scale producers to find buyers and sellers for their goods, as well as finding the kinds of services that they need at the right prices. So a good example is Hello Tractor, which is a two-sided software as a service platform that links tractor owners to farmers who require tractor services. And 
to ensure that the appropriate equipment is, is supplied by the right tractor owner, Hello Tractor uses clustering algorithms to efficiently match tractor demand to supply. And that considers things like the available supply, the logistics of delivering the tractor to that particular area, what kind of terrain the area has, what the farmer's requirements are, et cetera. The tractors are also fitted with IoT devices that track the length, intensity, and type of use, and that informs how much the farmer actually ends up paying at the end of the day. So with all of these um, profiled use cases in mind, we're now going to have a look at what the likely impacts that these use cases are as they start to have more scale and become more adopted by small scale producers. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Chloe, who'll take us through this section. Thank you, Mark. So before we dive in, it is important to note the complex web of positive and negative impacts. And depending on the context of where these AI and automation solutions are being applied, the magnitude of these positive and negative impacts will differ. For this reason, our investigation focused on the main impact pathways for how these impacts might arise. And these pathways were a result of in-depth analysis, as well as dialogue and solutioning discussions with our team and external stakeholders. So based on the findings of our report, the largest enhancements are likely to be in agricultural productivity, although there are still additional positive outcomes predicted for cost efficiencies, inclusion and access, as well as climate resilience. However, it is important to note that these beneficial impacts will be coupled with both direct and broader risks to the agricultural value chain, which we'll touch on in just a moment. So AI and automation solutions can improve small-scale producer knowledge and decision-making across all stages of the agricultural production cycle. By helping the farmer make better choices on what type of plant to grow and under what conditions, allowing them to access locally available inputs like fertilizer and seed, as well as weather-based insurance, allows them to address potential risks to failure. And it also could help them enhance access to mechanization, which would all enable farmers to improve productivity, achieve cost efficiencies, and become more resilient to climate, all the while broadening the depth of farmers that can access these services. So we can see some initial evidence that suggests positive impacts across different sectors. In terms of farm management techniques, Wadwani AI has enabled farmers to increase their profits by 20%, while simultaneously decreasing pesticide usage by 25%. In terms of finance and risk application, Apollo Agriculture has allowed farmers to better access finance with manageable repayment terms, resulting in a 2.5 time increase in their crop yields. And finally, Hello Tractor has leveraged automation and AI to enhance supply chain and ecosystem management, which has resulted in increased quality of life, crop revenue, and crop production. It is important to note that all of these figures are self-reported impact data. And one of the recommendations in our report is actually for more rigorous impact studies on the impact of AI and automation by third parties. And whilst these examples offer exciting evidence of the potential positive impacts that AI and automation can have in the time to come, these positives can quickly become risks if we do not address the current situation which is the fact that only a very small segment of small-scale producers can access and leverage these innovative solutions. Given the situation, significant risks with AI and automation can occur as the distribution of these risks, as the distribution of these benefits is unlikely to be even. So there's the potential for labor shedding of ad hoc manual laborers, whose employment is influenced by seasonal fluctuations. Automated on-farm processes minimize the demand for this ad hoc labor, resulting in fewer seasonal employment opportunities in a sector that is typically a significant and reliable employer of low-skilled labor. In addition, 
if innovative technologies are not adopted evenly among small scale producers, there is a risk of inequitable distribution of benefits. This may occur if small scale producers that are more commercialized or have higher incomes are able to take advantage of ag tech solutions to improve their productivity, competitiveness, and earning potential. This would widen the productivity divide between these small scale producers and remote or lower income producers that may not have access to these solutions or even be able to afford them. Both of these consequences will exacerbate the exclusion of women and other marginalized populations. The implementation of AI and other innovative solutions across the agricultural value chain can also lead to several key ethical considerations that have the potential to strip farmers of their autonomy and lead to breakdowns in trust. In terms of data ownership, there are concerns regarding the collection and dissemination of farmer data to third parties. Agricultural big data is susceptible to privacy and security risks because it could be used nefariously by corrupt governments, competitors, or market traders. And this is particularly the case in low and middle income countries where their data protection regulation has the potential to be more nascent. Finally, a lack of accurate data can result in ag tech solutions not always being matched to the specific needs of minority groups of farmers. And it could lead to these producers receiving inaccurate and incoherent outputs as a result of these AI-enabled ad tech services. So that's a lot of information to take in, and we'd really love to hear from you at this point before we continue with the rest of our presentation. So if you have any questions, we really do welcome you to take this opportunity to ask. Um, we're also very happy to, to bring you off mute if you prefer to ask it vocally. So there's a few, a few options. There's a raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you raise your hand, we'll be able to take you off mute and we'd love to hear your comments or questions. You're also welcome to post any questions in the Q&A um, or post your comments in the chats as well. Yeah, we'll have another Q&A at the end. Um, so if anything else comes up, you're welcome to raise your hand at any point um, or post your questions or your comments in the chat. Okay. So now that we've taken you through the applications and associated potential impacts of AI on agri-food systems, we're now going to focus on solutions to steer AI and automation innovation towards more inclusive outcomes. We have just seen how the great potential of AI and automation solutions for small scale producers is being limited by several factors related to cost, local relevance, accessibility, and ethics of the solutions. These factors are limiting the development and adoption of commercially viable impactful and responsible products and services for small scale producers and the stakeholders that work with them. Constraints include missing market infrastructure, the need for capacity strengthening, governance and ethics gaps, and fragmented ecosystems, which are solvable through better coordinated and targeted interventions and investments from stakeholders across the ecosystem. The study undertaken by Genesis Analytics has catalyzed the beginning of this process by identifying a clear agenda for change across four objectives necessary to steer AI and automation towards these more inclusive outcomes. Looking at the first objective, we need to consider robust data and technology infrastructure. The availability and affordability of accurate and locally relevant data is arguably the biggest constraint to the proliferation of locally suitable AI applications in agriculture. One way to tackle this challenge 
is by creating and promoting open source data sets that can be used to train and improve AI applications. This is a valuable approach and one that has been supported by several stakeholders already. This includes the Lacuna Fund and GIZ's Fair Forward Initiative, amongst others. But it doesn't address the fact that collecting this data is expensive, and as such, it is often done privately by privately owned and profit-driven ag tech firms that are not willing to openly share one of their core commercial assets. What is needed is a mechanism that allows these private players, as well as the range of other stakeholders collecting and using data, to safely exchange and share data more easily in a way that recognizes and rewards the commercial value of this data. So in our report, we propose establishing an agricultural data exchange, focusing on specific low and middle income country regions as a mechanism with potential for achieving this. This data exchange needs to be facilitated by an independent third party, which we call the exchange operator, and who would be responsible for establishing the technical conditions for safely exchanging data. But the success of this exchange is even more so determined by understanding and providing incentives for the various data asset holders and data consumers to engage in these transactions. This slide that we're presenting now provides an overall illustration of how we envisage this taking place. The exchange itself may be piloted through a donor-funded grant, but should become sustainable itself by taking a portion of the transactional revenue to cover its own costs. AI models trained specifically for the agricultural domain and local geographies will markedly improve the accuracy and applicability of AI solutions in low and middle income countries, agri-food systems. For example, limited data sets in local languages mean many AI solutions only exist in English, limiting accessibility or resulting in incoherent language outputs from the AI system. However, building more locally relevant AI models from the ground up would be prohibitively costly, given the massive number of data points needed to effectively train a new model. So we would then want to look at transfer learning, which offers a more cost-effective solution. Thinking about our second objective, we need to consider farmer-centric and scalable solutions. In our study, we identified several constraints to the updating and adoption of AI-driven solutions for small-scale producers. Intermediary networks with potential for commercial sustainability are a critical human interface for small-scale producers to adopt AI and automation solutions. However, building and scaling an intermediary network is a costly and time-consuming process. As many intermediary networks already exist, a solution is to establish these networks as a shared infrastructure, wherein multiple ag techs and other organizations contribute to the costs of establishing and or utilizing the same networks. One example of this is the org organization Kuza, which recruits and trains young rural people to become human intermediaries for providing a bundle of products and services, as well as advice to small-scale producers in Kenya and India. Donors, governments, and ag techs should explore avenues to scale these shared intermediary networks in a gender-sensitive manner. One option would be to fund the creation of new networks in markets where they do not already exist, although this would be resource intensive for the reasons that we've already discussed. So an alternative is to provide support from existing network building organizations to expand to new markets through a combination of finance, market intelligence, technology support, and industry connections. However, these organizations often do not have the capacity to expand beyond their current op operations. So a more sustainable option is to support the franchising of these network builders existing intellectual property and license this to other organizations 
looking to replicate this model in other markets. This will then unlock government demand for climate smart digital advisory solutions. I will now hand back to Mark, who will take you through our remaining two objectives. Thanks, Chloe. So I think um, we also have to acknowledge that in addition to this kind of fundamental technology transition that's happening at the moment, low and middle income countries are also undergoing a complex mix of, of other transitions that are impacting um, and intersecting with AI and automation. Um, and so in our work, we've zoned in on a couple, including the demographic transition, the broader digital transition, and the green transition. Um, for the purposes of today's workshop, um, I'm just going to focus in on the demographic transition, which is the wave of young people who are now hitting the labor force at enormous scale and the imperative of connecting them to income generating opportunities at scale. So, you know, in the work that we've been doing, we have definitely found some risks around automation displacing low skilled manual labor on the farm. But we've also found that there are significant opportunities for new forms of work in the AI value chain. And this includes functions like data capturing, ag tech booking agents, um, lead farmers getting paid to adopt tech solutions and teach other farmers in their communities how to do the same, drone pilots, and several others. But it's definitely not automatic that people who are pushed out of traditional work opportunities can easily transition into these new ones. And so our recommendation is to invest in vocational training and skilling that can prepare rural young people, especially women, to take up these new work opportunities in the AI value chain. And the organizations in this value chain who are creating work opportunities should themselves be investing in sourcing, screening, and training these rural young people to fulfill these opportunities. Governments and donors can subsidize the cost of these activities through instruments like wage subsidies or challenge funds. And then the last area that we thought required um, a lot of solution generation is the objective of ethical AI and data governance. And I think this one is arguably one of the most challenging to address because the pace of innovation in the space is moving so quickly um, with new ethical considerations that are occurring as the technology's capabilities continue to evolve. But um, the week before last, there were two really significant developments for global AI governance. The first is the Bletchley Declaration on AI Safety which saw 28 countries from around the world, including in Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and in the EU, agreeing to the urgent need to, to better understand and collectively manage the potential risks of AI. So the, the Bletchley Declaration recognizes the potential for serious uh, or even catastrophic harm, either deliberate or unintentional, stemming from the evolving capabilities of AI models and their propensity for bias and privacy infringement. The second big development was the executive order on the safe, secure, and trustworthy development and use of artificial intelligence that was recently released by US President Biden. And the order directs the development of new standards for AI safety and security, including some pointed actions for Congress, for industry, national security agencies, and the science and academic community more broadly. So these shifts in global consensus building and the development of standards for the safe application of AI are likely to trickle down to similar developments at the country level in low and middle income countries. But in the meanwhile, addressing the particular ethical challenges of AI and agriculture are gonna be hard to do because there isn't a clear regulator with the mandate to govern AI solutions applied in agriculture specifically. In most low and middle income countries, there isn't a dedicated digital regulator. regulator. And so the regulation of AI applications mostly falls to sector regulators, if at all. And so for these reasons, you know, we're actually advocating for starting with solutions that support industry self-regulation with strong commitment devices used by donors, investors, and governments who procure these AI solutions, whilst the regulatory approaches catch up. 
But in order for industry to self-regulate, the solution providers need to have clarity on the kinds of agriculture-specific ethical risks that their solutions pose and how to address them. So our first solution is to develop a domain-specific and gender-sensitive ethical impact assessment framework for the use of AI in agriculture. Now, there are many of these frameworks that exist already, but none of them exist that are specific to the agricultural sector. And so this needs to be addressed. And in particular, the clients of AI solution providers, like donors and governments, should use the adoption of this framework as a condition for procuring their services. Um, the second solution is to look at how to explicitly address the potential for AI bias by providing common resources in the form of unbiased data sets, explainability tools and AI failure monitoring in agriculture as is required. So we've proposed establishing regional agricultural AI labs that can define the bounds of AI bias in agriculture, provide guidelines on AI explainability, such as model cards and explainability 360 products tailored to agriculture and collate unbiased training debts, uh, debt data sets to be shared with the ag tech community. So these are the, the four kind of big areas of solutioning and some of the concrete solutions that, that we've put on the table and the end of our presentation. Um, if there are any questions, comments from anybody in the audience, we would love to hear from you. Um, you're welcome to use the raise hand function. At the bottom, you can post a, a question in the Q&A or put your comments into the chat. While we see if there are any questions or comments, I would like to thank our partners, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and USAID for sponsoring this work um, and guiding us through this process. If you are interested in the findings um, of what we've been talking through today, there is a report available that goes into a lot more detail. I'm going to paste the link to the report in the chat so that you can all see it. Otherwise, you can go onto the Genesis Analytics website. It's www.genesis-analytics.com. And under the reports section, you'll find it there.